Hi everybody, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. With me today, I've got Patrick Dawson, and we're going to be talking about the basic principles for success in the digital realm. Um, before we dig in, I always ask my guests this, Patrick, where can people find you? You can find all my work at my website, digitalsharecropper.com. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so um, digital is really important. Um, uh, it surprises me. I've been on LinkedIn for 20 years and Twitter on 15 years, but it surprises me that even people don't seem to understand what digital is about. What, what's your definition, Patrick? Well, I use it as a um, sort of a metaphor for everything we do offline. There's an analog on the uh, digital space. Yep. So there's digital property in the same way that we have physical property. You have a your persona, sort of like your resume and all that that you're putting out to the world, your voicing. It's, it's just a copy of the offline online that you access on the internet. And I think it's as simple as that, isn't it? That um, that actually what we're doing, we do, we, 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 we've done a whole bunch of things in digital, uh, sorry, in, in analog, and now what we're doing them is, is in, in digital. And actually it's no different. Right, it's just a different medium. Yes, yeah. So when I meet you in the analog world, if I put my hand, you, the other person usually grabs it and shakes the hand. And in a way, we're doing that on digital as well. Exactly. Uh, so we should say please and thank you and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Exactly as we would in the real world. Ex right. So um, you um, you talked about, um, there was a number of three things that you, you, you um, talked about for basic principles. One is about authenticity. T tell us about that. Sure. So authenticity, I think a lot of people just assume it's being honest, having integrity, stuff like that. But authenticity to me is a little bit more encompassing where the way you would speak to somebody in person is how you speak online. You use your own jargon. You don't try to conform to, I've got to be proper or I've got to be edgy like somebody else. It's exactly how you would present yourself in the real world. You present yourself digitally. And so authenticity is about being honest and having integrity, but it's also about just speaking things in your voice from your experience. I think, where where was it that, that at some point along the, 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 the lines of being digital, people seemed to think it was a way of, in effect, kind of like dressing up, um, yeah. where um, what they would do is, you know, there's an expectation, we, there's ex expectation that when we come on digital, that we're somebody that we're not, or we're somebody different. Which then isn't authentic. Authenticity is, is not. It's, it's not authenticity, is it? It's kind of like a business card. I see it where you take the best picture possible, and you pick a very nice font, and you try to have a nice tagline. And I think it just sort of worked on its way from there. Where at first you're just trying to present yourself in the best light, and then it's a little bit about embellishing, and then about everybody else is doing it. Sort of like everyone's getting dressed up for church on Sunday, so you're getting dressed up, but you usually don't dress that nice, and so it's. Uh, in essence, it becomes this facade to where you could only hope to live up to your digital uh, version of yourself. Here's me getting on on a private jet, um, and it's not really a private jet. It's a, or, or this is me in front of my Ferrari, and what you've done is you just rented it for the the, the weekend or something. Exactly. Uh, and and that and 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 that's not you know that's not really being your authentic self. And I think that it, you, you, I mean I I agree with you that you need to be who you are. In effect. On digital, it's 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 the dig, your it's your digital twin of your analog self. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we do um, is that we, one of the things that we do is that we make sure that we have backgrounds. So my background here reflects who I am, um, and and reflects some of the things that I'm interested in, and and that often creates conversations because people say, "What's that there?" Mm -hmm. But it's something that, um, and then I can, you know, I, I like talking about that because everybody likes talking about themselves. But um, it also is something about, the, the, they can find out something about you. It's my authentic, my authenticity self. It's part, that's part of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know my background is a little bland, but I do. I know, I know, no, no, I'm not <laughs> saying that you're a, bla you're, no. uh, you're a bland person, Patrick. No, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very much into audio. So I have um, off camera, off to the side, I have some amps and uh guitar, bass, drum, that sort of thing. So this oh, is fantastic. a, yeah, it's my soundproof room. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so so what can we do to, to um, present ourselves um, and make sure that we're being our, our authentic self on, um, on, on, on digital? 
I think the biggest way is to just say things in your own words. There's this tendency to find a thought leader and to use one of their quotes to express the sentiment that you have. But if you've written content on that same topic, there's a sentence in there that's quotable. So pull your own quote out of there. Don't just try to add a tagline because if someone's searching for that famous person's quote, they probably don't also care about whatever you're talking about. They're just wanting that quote to add to something. So that, that's an easy way right there. Just you're making quotable content right now. Just quote yourself. I, I, I love that. I, I, once put, I, I once put a quote out saying, I think we've actually quoted all the quotes so we can stop that now. Because... <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and and then someone else put out another quote. It's like, you know, just speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless there's something that very much encapsulates it and it re really resonates with you. But for the most part, yeah, I, I try to only quote my own material. And uh, that's what I recommend but others would do as well. So so if we're, if we're, if, 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 if we're watching this and we want to start and they're thinking, okay, I'm going to be my, uh, I, I need to be, do something about my digital presence and I need to be authentic. What, what, where would I start? What would I do? Well, you could just start with some of the color schemes you use, perhaps on your website or your social media backgrounds. Something that, if, what I like to say is that we're really projecting onto the world. So I assume people are going to be a certain way because I am a certain way. And I know that's not correct, but since that's how most of us operate, just make the assumption that there is someone who has your same style and taste, someone that likes to hear your type of voice. I mean, just think of all the music out there. And I might listen to something and say, this sounds awful, but they have a million followers and there's people waiting for their next album. So if you're setting yourself up, it's you're mirroring and saying, there's someone who will like the stuff that I like as well. So I don't have to say, well, blues are in right now or oranges are in right now. So that's what I'm going to make my logo. You just say, this is what sort of what I have a taste for. This is a style I sort of like, and this is what I'm going to put out there. And there will be people who are drawn to that. I, I, I agree. And um, I think that's great advice. Um, it's going back to being yourself really, isn't it? And, 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 and not, uh, you know, there's too many people, I think what read an article saying that having a blue logo is what you need. And so they go out and get a blue logo rather than saying, well, actually quite, I quite like pink or whatever mm -hmm. the color is. Yeah. Um, so the, the, um, the second uh, point that you make was about structure. Um, so, so, so tell us, so, so in terms of basic principles for success in the digital realm, how can I use structure? Well, structure really is a sort of a broad, expansive topic here, but yes. I like to see it uh, if we took look at two big components, one being how we structure our day and our work. Mm -hmm. So the time management and project management type of things. And the other side is how we structure the actual output. So content, for instance, so how you would structure a blog post or how you would structure a social media post or a video or any of those type of things. So often, um, not to quote someone who isn't me, but there's this famous quote that says um, content uh, or structure is more important than content in the transmission of information. And what I take from that is that you can have two pieces of content that are identical in substance, but one has better presentation and people will gravitate towards the one with better presentation. And so if it's easy to read, there's not lots of white space, they've used a good font, people will be drawn to that. So think of how we structure things as more of um, a presentation to the world. So if we structure our time, we want it to be the most efficient and streamlined, and we want it to work within our confines. And if we're structuring our work or our website, we want it to be user-friendly to the end user. So it's they're going to come to the website and know exactly what we want them to do. It's not going to be all convoluted. We're not going to have a bunch of stuff that bounces around and pops up and slides in that we think is going to grab their attention, when in reality, it's going to distract them and give them a not very good experience. So I think structure is a sort of all-encompassing how we like the doing part of our business. Like, how are we doing things? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. So in terms of if we pick those there's, there's two things. So what can we do? What can we could be doing better to structure our day? I think a lot of this just goes down to processes. And if we say, I do this thing over and over, I need to sit down and say, what are the steps that I'm doing start to finish to do this? Are these in the right order? Do these make the most sense? Is there some way where I can automate something or delegate something to someone else. And that starts with understanding what you're actually doing, almost like a narration. Think of narrating your day and, okay, I'm doing this now, I'm doing this now. And then that's the way that you're able to get that down into a process, a checklist, or an instruction sheet that you can send off to a virtual assistant. And it kind of even works the same way if you're using AI to sort of supplement some of your workload. You need to be able to give a good query to get a good answer. 
And that starts with understanding exactly what you're doing, when you're doing and how you're doing it. Do you think, I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big time blocker. Um, and, um, you know, I just block out time in my, my calendar for, for doing certain things. Is that something that you would recommend? Oh yeah. I would say test it out. I, we use a lot of Pomodoros and we've eventually found that something like 45 minute sets instead of 25 are a little bit more helpful. Cause at 25, I feel like I just start getting going, but 45 yeah. minutes on and then take a few minutes to walk around. And it's really just to look away from the screen and to just have, um, uh, look 20 feet into the distance for 20 seconds is what I've heard people say. So just get a little bit of that blue light out of your eyes and then uh, a little reset and then right back to it. But um, all in all, I tend to work no more than two or three hours in a row without taking a substantial break because I feel right. like I just start to lose my edge at that point. Yes. Yeah. And what, what you used a word begin with P what did you call what would... Pomodoro? Yes. What's, what's that? Um... It's based on, I think there's these tomato timers I think it might be Italian where it's 25 minutes of work and then five minutes of rest. Okay. And then on every fourth set, I think you take a 15 minute break. Right. Um, one of my uh, to, uh, to do list apps has it built into it. So it's, you can just press a button and go. Okay. So, so you actually use a to do, uh, to do list app then. Yeah. I, I use a thing called tick tick and it just has a section for the, the timer. Okay. Okay, but so in terms of to-do lists, because I just get, get, get scrappy bits of paper, which are then you know th throw on the floor and then then I just pick up. Um, is is I mean I, I'm not a big to-do. I, I actually build my to-do list into my calendar. Hmm. Yeah, I. Yeah, because, there's uh, any which way you can do it. I mean, because so my my to-do list tends to be little things, and I'll actually block out um, time in my calendar, and I'll, and I'll call it like bits and pieces or something like that, which is, well, I'll do loads and loads of little things mm -hmm. rather than doing one big thing, but it, it, it me and, and I'll collect them on, on the bits of paper. And, and it's just, uh, just a way that I try and find it of, of structuring. Otherwise you can do, a, 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 you know, it's like, you just get distracted with things. Yeah. We call them loose ends. So any little thing that's, it's sort of irrelevant. If you have too many of those little things on your um, plate, things to do, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts. Even if you're focused on something, there's this little piece of your attention that is somewhere saying, there's this small thing I haven't done oh, yet. There's an email coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I turned off all my all the dings and bings. I don't have no dings and bings on, on my, my at all. Exactly. I just have one app that will that my wife can contact me by. Everything else, I have to look at it. Well, I, it's, it's true. Actually, I have one ding, which is when 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 a guest comes into the uh, uh, waiting room when I'm running a podcast and I know that that's the only di only ding that I have on my on my uh, so what about um, I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about structure for content um, I think quite often what happens with content is we, we're so excited about writing it and telling uh, telling what we want to say that we don't often think about the reader exactly and I think that's where structure plays a huge role because if you think about it, they're going from a journey. Once they see your headline or they see your share, you've presented something that this is what they're gonna get if they follow this link. And you wanna make sure that they get that. And also you wanna make sure that it's not convoluted. So I get there and I'm reading for 10 minutes and I think, is this coming to a point somewhere? Is this one of those gotchas where you have to sign up to learn more? I have no idea. So it's we, we have this whole process. Uh, I have a blog post about this, where this formula where you're taking them from this, basically from the headline to the finish line, and when they get in, you're explaining, you're clarifying what the headline meant. You're having a table of contents. So if they just needed one piece, you're making it easier for them to navigate there. You're not making too many calls to action and the call to action needs to be relevant and make sense. So it's this whole formula of, I have expectations that they're coming to my post and that they're signing up, that they're commenting something, but they have expectations that whatever that headline promised them is gonna be there. And they're gonna have that information distilled down in something actionable or informational depending on exactly what they were looking for yeah it's, it's really good advice um i think people don't re people don't realize that the the only time that you know that a blog was good was when you've read it so um um, um people are always think i've just written a good, good blog i've written lots of blogs that nobody's ever read ever read um and um and <laughs> uh, and 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 so you know you you've got to get people to read it in the first place um, and then keep it simple. And you only remember one thing. So quite often what we do is we tend to cram blogs because what we're trying to do is show people how clever we are 
Whereas actually what we need to do is actually keep it very, very simple for people. Yeah, I like to do the, you make a promise in the headline, the first four lines, I sort of clarify that promise to let them know this is, you know, in case you were misunderstanding this, here's what you've got. And then the very end of the blog, you just sort of rehash exactly what the headline in that intro said. It's sort of that sandwich method because they're only going to remember the beginning and end. And so that way it just really hammers home the point that they were trying to take away. Uh, I, I love that calling it the, the, the title and the, and the opening paragraph of promise, because it is what you're doing is that you're, you know, you're, um, you're promising this is what the, you're going to get this information and, and I'm going to show you how you're going to get that. Yeah. An authentic person would keep their promise. So it, it sort of goes hand in hand. Um, so um, the, the third point is about bootstrapping. So tell me, so, so this is about, um, so t tell me about your, your third element around boot bootstrapping. Well, I think early on in your business, bootstrapping is the literal managing of funds when they're, you know, they're tight and you don't know where to prioritize. So if you think of an early business and you only have a little bit of capital, you're not going to put it on something frivolous. You're going to put it on the, the thing that's going to move you forward the most. So it, let's say if you're doing podcasting, maybe it's a camera or a microphone. You're not going to fool around with, I have to have the best computer. I have to have the best outfit. I have to have the best backdrop. It's just maybe it's even before that, maybe it's an internet connection, but you start out with limited funds. And so it's really a filter that you prioritize things with. And the issue becomes that I've seen is that when people start to get a little bit successful or they see some traction, they tend to throw that out the window. And then they see any shiny tool that's marketed to them that this is going to help you. This is going to move you forward. This is the next big thing. And you're going to get in on some really good deal. People just sort of throw bootstrapping out the window and start acquiring all these tools that are promising to help all these things that are going to make their life easier. And next thing you know, their wallet's empty and they have a whole suite of tools and they don't work together very nicely and half of them aren't exactly what they wanted. And so I think bootstrapping is important because at the beginning you have to, but as you grow, you it's doubly important to maintain that mindset of, I need to prioritize. Maybe this is an excellent tool for a business that's five times the size of mine. So just put a pin in that and come back. As my business grows, then maybe take another look at it. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't need this uh, really expensive SEO tool if I don't have very much traffic learn the basics. And then at some point you might grow into that point where you need those, uh, you know, proprietary things. Having run my own business for the last seven years, it's probably, that is really fantastic advice. I saw someone on uh, LinkedIn saying the other day saying, I'm just starting my own business. Can you tell me which apps to have? And there was all people, all their friends piling in saying that there, there was all these different apps. And um, I pointed out, well, uh, Dropbox and um, Google, is exactly the same thing. If you can, you can, you're holding, you're storing files. You don't, you don't need both of them. Yeah. Whereas somebody was actually recommending you have both. It's like, well, yeah, in it may be in a in a corporate company you would have both, but you can you can store files in in on Google. So you can have you might as well have Google um, apps and 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 Google e and email because it's mm -hmm. cheap because it's it's per month. Whereas if you buy the the Microsoft one, you have to pay for a year. Those are the different things that you end up finding out when you've been running a business for a while. Yeah, and many apps have a sort of freemium model where you can try it and say, am I even getting any use out of this? Am I getting any results? And then maybe, yeah, upgrade to the the expensive plan or the, uh, the premium plan, whatever. But yeah, a lot of times people get them without even realizing, maybe this is useful in my business, but there's no way I'm going to do it. So you've just wasted your money. And then they get you with that. You get two months free if you pay for a year. So not only are you overpaying for things, but you're you're paying a year at a time for something you might not end up using. Yeah. Um, and and you also talk about mindset as well. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of mindset things that I think are important. And one of them that I always tend to come back to is, have you, I don't know, you, if there's a book called The Slight Edge. And um, it's really about just making incremental gains over time. And I think within business, there's this expectation of you're going to have time freedom or you're going to be financially free and thinking that there's this big thing that's going to move you forward when in reality that big thing is just the culmination of all these little things adding up over time that whole, that phrase of like how many grains of sand make a heap so it's like at some point those little insignificant grains of sand will become this heap of sand and that's the concept of slight edge that we try to use in our business and try to recommend others take that approach and there might be something that moves you forward exponentially but if you're out there looking for it you're missing all of these opportunities right in front of you uh, it's it's great advice, Patrick. Um, I've seen it in my own business. You know, we go along like this, and then we'll go up a bit, but then we'll go along. Um, 
but you've got to focus on what you need what you need to do um and we we say here we just get in the swim lane and you just keep going and don't worry about what else, anybody else is doing because um you just got to do what you've got to do you know mm -hmm. uh patrick thank you so much for coming on and talking about the basic principles for success in the digital realm fascinating conversation and some great um great advice that you've been able to to, to put out where, remind people where they can find you everything's available at digitalsharecropper.com that's digital digital sharecropper sharecropper.com fantastic mm -hmm. thank you so much patrick for coming on i really appreciate it thanks